Okay. I assume you guys know the hymn for today. It's oh, pretty yeah. familiar. common, new, yeah. familiar. Let's go. I am trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only Thee. Trusting Thee for full salvation, great and free. I am trusting Thee for pardon, at Thy feet I bow. For Thy grace and tender mercy, trusting now. I am trusting Thee for cleansing in the crimson flood, trusting Thee to make me holy by Thy blood. I am trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, never Father, it is often a struggle to accept your will for our lives, especially when what we want isn't granted, and we can't understand your will and ways. Yet we thank you for your word that points us to Christ. We thank you for other believers who support us in times of need. And we especially thank you for our Savior, who followed your will, even to the cross. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, 2 Corinthians 11. Alright, 1 to 12. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as a servant deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you received a different spirit from the one, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am in the least inferior to these super-apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself, so that you might be exalted, because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. Can we go to 12? Or yep, 12. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. So, question number one. Paul's great concern for the Corinthians, as well as his love for them, spills out in this section. Notice the imagery Paul uses in verse 2. How does Paul describe the relationship of the Corinthians with Christ, and what is his own role? Well, the Corinthians are the bride. Yep. And Paul, and Paul is the one who brought the bride to Christ, the bridegroom. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe anything else? I just say, yeah, instead of bride, it is a pure virgin betrothed to the husband, to one husband, which yeah. is the church, the Christ. And so, right. So <coughs> Paul's kind of the uh, the matchmaker, I guess. Um, well, no, I think Paul kind of described himself as a parent. 
not in this section, uh, but I think later on he'll describe yeah. himself as a parent. Yeah. And I think that makes some sense. Uh, well, I think that then, still fits with the metaphor. Back then, didn't the fathers arrange the wedding for their daughter? Or yeah. The for their daughter, so. Yeah. So that makes a little bit of sense with the metaphor. I mean, it, Paul's in the church too, so he's also the bride. But, uh, but yeah. So Christ is the bridegroom. Uh, the Corinthians are the bride, the church, and Paul brought them to him. Good. Number two. Now notice the imagery Paul uses in verse 3. To whom does he compare the Corinthians and to whom does he compare the false teachers? Corinthians to Eve, false teachers to the serpent who was Satan. Yep. False teachers are compared to Satan who twists and uh, yeah, twists God's word. Um, and the Corinthians are Adam and Eve. Especially Eve. Eve. Okay, that was pretty two easy ones getting us going. Uh, number three, then, in verse four, Paul refers to, to three teachings that are different from the teachings they had learned. The false teachers at Corinth had so distorted the gospel that what resulted was a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. Not the genuine article at all but a poor substitute. In letter A, how is a Christian to determine whether a teaching is in fact the true gospel? Evaluate them against the scriptures. Yes. Okay. Good answer. Do you have anything other than that? Uh, yeah, examine them against the scriptures. And not, that doesn't just mean uh, looking at Googling uh, I don't know, like a Bible verse about this or something. Uh, because there are lots of people that make lots of different arguments using the Bible that are wrong, right? Uh, so we need to use the whole scriptures. <clears throat> we need to use the whole scripture. Yeah. Uh, I can think of an example going back when our daughter was in, in college. She was taking a chemistry class. I don't remember which one it was. And <coughs> she bombed a test and she couldn't figure out why. I said, well, Jack, are you studying this stuff? And I, she said, no, I'm reading it. I said, reading that and cut it. You've got to study it, understand what it's saying to you. And the same is true with the Bible. You've got to take the Bible within the context and framework of other verses throughout Scripture and let Scripture interpret Scripture. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can lead yourself on a wayward path. Yeah. That's what I said, you know, not just compare it, you know, study the Scripture so you're well versed yourself so you can distinguish false teachings from. Yeah. Yeah, so you said let Scripture interpret Scripture. What does that mean? I am not going to, if there's, I'm, I'm going to take a verse of Scripture, I'm going to look at the notes here within the study Bible and the cross-references in here and go back and tease that apart. It's like this gigantic spider web. I'm picking up one piece on the spider web, and I need to know what that means within the context of everything else around it. And it might be Old Testament or New Testament. Yeah, it yeah. might be several Old Testament, but maybe refer you back, and then that refers to something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, especially with the uh, the more confusing, complicated verses, or just interesting, where there's something about them just seems weird. Um, so when we say we use Scripture to interpret Scripture, uh, we mean that we take the clear verses, uh, the ones that aren't confusing, Jesus' teachings, um, things like that, and then you use those to uh, to look at the other verses, so that you're using the whole context of Scripture and the whole context of the teaching of Christ uh, to understand the more confusing ones. Instead of uh, so that's how we do it, uh, but there are other denominations that do it differently. Um, so uh, the Catholic Church uh, they use tradition kind of to interpret Scripture. And so they look back at their, uh, yeah, at, at, at tradition and then also uh, things like uh, papal decrees and things like that to, uh, to understand scripture. Um, and then there are other denominations that use the culture to interpret scripture. And so they look at the difficult verses of scripture, things that are maybe controversial, and then they look at uh, how, yeah, if that still fits with their culture, with what's happening in the world. 
And then they use that as a way to understand uh, those difficult passages. And we right. can look at we can look at some like our own ELC. I should say our own ELC. We can look at the ELCA, and they're trying to twist scripture to match their paradigm of the world. And the Methodist Church is going through that right now too. Yeah, yeah. So that's what those were really the denominations that I was talking about. I, was, okay. I just wasn't dragging them through the mud or. <laughs> uh, no, but you're right. Right. It's the ELC. They're, they're ELCA, the Methodist Church. The, you guys really have the United Church of Christ here. A uh, little bit. I think so. <clears throat> okay, I don't know. It's big in Wisconsin because it's all German Reformed people that became mm. that. Mm. Um, but yeah, so those are those are denominations that do that. They take scripture and then they look at it through the lens of culture. Uh, but in some way, that's also using tradition, but in the reverse way that the Catholic Church uses it. Good. Okay. Scripture interprets scripture. We, and then. Um, yeah, okay. All right, let's go on to P then. How ought a Christian respond when it is apparent that someone is teaching a false gospel and not the true gospel? 2 John 7, 2-11. Turn away from those. Yeah, turn away. Any other thoughts? Well, yeah, for this... Literally, what he told them was, "Don't welcome them into your house, mm -hmm. or give him any greeting." And so, I guess it's avoid giving him any welcome, right. recognition, or or aid. I guess that's yeah. Uh, I think part of that is uh, when they talk about houses. I think maybe they're talking about like because they had church in house their houses. Of worship. Yeah, I think a house of worship, and and the house as well. I mean, the house. Think back to the beginning of. I think second Corinthian, Corinthian, or no, I think in like Acts and uh, places like that where they're the house, like you're not even allowed to invite Gentiles to go into your house because mm. they're unclean. You're not even allowed to do, uh, yeah, eat with other people. And so the house has a deeper meaning than just uh, uh, than how we think of it today for them. So yeah, I think it's worship as well. Uh, don't allow them in worship. Um, but especially don't allow them to teach and worship. I think there's one more key, uh, key thing in there. In first line it says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Well, the converse of that truth is also true. Everyone who uh, abides in the teaching of Christ does have God. So I think abiding in the teaching of Christ is key there too. Yeah, okay, so kind of like a defensive thing. Uh, yeah, abide in the teaching of Christ. That's good. I don't think it says that in any of these verses, but, you know, do you, are we called to speak out to say these are false teachings so that yeah, people so. recognize that and know that who might not understand that? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think definitely. <clears throat> it's kind of hard, uh, especially in our culture, I think it's hard to to do that in a loving way, um, because yeah, just people sometimes. Yeah, because don't that, we have an obligation to spread the real gospel to them too? I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it's like we want to spread the gospel, um, but when we're challenging teachings, uh, that we're that's really preaching the law to people. Um, well, if you don't say anything then people are going to say, well, it must not be bad because they're still doing it. Yeah, no, that's a good yeah. point, too. Or they might think disagree if yeah. you don't at least acknowledge Silence is compliant. That right? I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. know, based on my, you know, learnings and reading the Bible, that's not how I read it. But at least, you know, you can't argue with people, but like you said, it's probably not going to be good, but maybe at least acknowledge that you disagree or disagree and have a different belief and maybe why if you can yeah. point out why you believe it's Yeah, so it's a lot easier to do uh, to just kind of quash yeah. uh, false things in the church but like in the world where there's all this which I think that's maybe the next question or something or later question uh, but in the world there's all this kind of false 
teaching about Christianity out there, and so it's like, how do we address that? And how do you address that with people you know, people that you work with, um, people that your family, stuff like that? It's hard. Because, um, yeah, you want to do, yeah, I think that's who said was great. You want them to know that you disagree with them, um, but not just argue with them. Uh, because that arguing most of the time just kind of makes people set in their own ways and even more. Um, okay, but I think we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, so then number four. Um, Paul admits that he lacked something the false teachers had, but he also claims he has something they do not have. Identify both and explain why what Paul had was more important than what he did not have. Okay. Um, what did Paul lack? Skill in speaking? Yeah. Not an eloquent speaker. Allegedly. You keep saying that. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, I don't know. If we can really... I mean, he might just be being humble. Uh, well, his, his method of speech may be a lot simpler and... Mm -hmm. You know, not as emotional, whereas you know those guys were. You know, you know. No, that's everything. a good point because this is kind of like the golden age of like rhetoric. Yeah. So oh. people, are, yeah. And then the word I was going to think through was charismatic. There you go. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I mean that's what it's like. Some politicians can do it. <laughs> fool everybody. You're trying right. to <laughs> no, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the charismatic. Um, this is yeah, kind of the golden age of like. People, their whole job is to speak. That's what we keep talking about. Is all these these super apostles, the, uh, the false teachers, are philosophers or whatever that are going around and trying to gain a following or something. So there's people doing this all over, and uh, rhetoric is kind of rhetoric is like the art of speaking. Uh, it's just kind of being developed now. So that's that's a good point. Well, when I was in high school. Um, in order to graduate, especially if you're going on into college or a field that required one and one thing, they uh, suggested you take speech. And if you took speech, then it was going, you, could, you wouldn't have to take it when you were in college. Because the idea was to get you used to talking in front of the classroom, in front of the group, and how you do it. And, you know, yes. whole. So he may not have necessarily had that type of training, but he had the knowledge of Christ, so. Yeah, so that's the thing he does have, right? What's, what is the thing that he does have then? Really? The knowledge of Christ. What does he say exactly? Doesn't he say, he says like direct revelation or something, right? Yeah. Well, that's what, that's, that's to explain why that, what Paul had was more important part, I think, is that he had been given that from a direct revelation of from Jesus Christ, not from any man. Yeah. yeah. That's the second part of the question. Well, he, his way of speaking also, he mentions, he makes it plain to them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's the message good. Of the gospel, so. Yeah, so it's not as like eloquent or flowery as what they're saying, or even, yeah, charismatic probably goes into that as well. He's not trying to, uh, I don't know, trick them into yeah. uh, believing it or... I'm not trying to stir up their emotions to... Yeah. Um, I've listened to... Manipulate. That's the word. And, you know, they're up here yeah. <laughs> from my standpoint. And if you dumb it down, which I think maybe Paul was trying to do, is dumb yeah, it down yeah, so that it's more simple and they can, more people can grasp it. If you talk and nobody can understand you, what yeah. good is it? Well, he made that comment later on when he's talking about you're on a spiritual milk here. We got to get you that whole solid yeah. food. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but you got to start with the yeah. milk. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Good. Good. Um, let's keep doing that. Number five. In verses seven to nine, Paul refers to how he had lowered himself before the Corinthians by refusing payment from them. What was Paul's motive in doing this? The gospel of Jesus Christ is free. And he didn't want to uh, instill a burden to them. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Well, if you're paying somebody, then you're kind of subject to their uh, yeah, commands the, the, or the patron kind of relationship yeah. that's pretty common back then, where you have like, somebody who's supporting you. No ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. Uh, it kind of also gives us the answer to the question. He lowered himself, right, to raise them up. That's always the language that Paul uses. Uh, because that's what Christ did for us. He lowered himself so that we might be exalted. And so Paul is doing the same thing. To me, there's a real dichotomy here. It's like you have the Corinthians, which is a fairly wealthy society, fairly wealthy com community. Paul's using funds provided by the impoverished Macedonians to yeah. kind of talk, talk to these rich people. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I kind of wondered if he mentioned <clears> that <throat> to make them feel a little guilty. Here, we're asking nothing yeah, I'm from you, the other but these other people are supporting us freely. <laughs> yeah. They have no choice to minister to you. Folks, yeah. And these are poor folks. They know you. you. They know you guys need help. Yeah. So I would think yeah. I feel a little bit yeah, your money not going to save you, buddy. As a Corinthian, I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder. If, yeah, it's like uh, maybe there's something in here going back again to that collection that we were talking about in eight. Uh, still kind of reminding them of that. Did anybody have anything else for that? Well, it's also with him not taking money, it puts him underneath the. Uh, super apostles who are taking money so that he can use it as a uh, thing against them to say, you know, if they want to be equal to me, they can give up their money too. Yeah, so it's a little bit another point of distinction between him and the, the super apostles or the, uh, whatever you want to call them, the false teachers. Good point. Um, Alright, let's keep going. Number six. How would Paul's bringing the gospel to the Corinthians without pay have undermined the false teachers? Base your response on what you have already learned in earlier sessions of this course of all these teachers and their motives. Okay, so why... We kind of talked about it a little bit already, uh, but let's say it again. Why would not accepting pay undermine the false teachers? Well, the false teachers requested pay before doing anything. Yeah, probably. Uh, there's not a lot of details exactly about what we had to give but the teachers. But so, yeah, they required pay or something. Um, any other thoughts? I think um, Paul contrasts his motivation with the false teachers, false teachers being paid. Paul's motivation was simply the love of Christ for him that is reflected in his love to Corinthians. Yeah, I think maybe that's a good point, trying to point out what their real motivation was, <clears throat> undermining uh, what they were saying, maybe. Maybe they were saying that their motivation is dead. Uh, but if you look at what they, they were taking the money, and so that was their real motivation, maybe something like that. There's not really an answer to this question. Uh, just kind of thoughts on what you, how that might undermine them. Um, any other thoughts for that one? All right, <clears throat> day number two, it's a short day, 11 to 21. 13 to 21. Thanks. <laughs> For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan distinguishes himself <coughs> as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I, will, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. 
All right, there's some confusing language. Sarcasm. In here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sarcasm. I know. It's kind of like you read it first, like, what? Yeah. You're too wise for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's probably, if we knew, if we, if we all knew Greek, uh, if we were just listening to it, it would be a little bit more clear. Uh, but yeah, there's all these, yeah, it's confusing. But that's okay. Um, number seven. <clears throat> In order to deceive people, Satan masquerades as an angel of light, and his servants as servants of righteousness. What are some examples of our from our culture of such deception? Cult leaders. Hmm? Cult leaders. Mm -hmm. Okay, cult leaders. Some of the false doctrines that parade around Christianity. Okay. And yeah, I yeah. Some of the. Uh, False doctrines, especially the so there's different kinds of false doctrine. There is heterodox, heterodox false doctrine <clears throat> is, is doctrines that uh, do not make you not a Christian anymore. So, like, um, believing that the Lord suffer is just a sign, that's a heterodox uh, belief, but then there is. Uh, there is heretical. And so heretical are things that make you not a Christian anymore. And so those are things that attack the, tr the Trinity. Yeah, like not believing Christ is true God. He's only a man. Yeah, yeah. And so those are heretical, uh, heretical doctrine. So heterodox, the, the three, there's three kind of descriptions of, do of doctrine. There's orthodox, which is the Lutheran faith, uh, orthodox beliefs. And then there is heterodox, which are the uh, the things that are not that don't make you not okay. The start over. So there's heterodox, which are false doctrine, uh, but they don't undermine you being a Christian. So you can still be a Christian and believe them, praying to the saints, uh, stuff like that. Anything that is not Lutheran but is still kind of Christian uh, is heterodox. And then there is heretical, which are false teachings that make you not a Christian anymore. And so, yeah, I think that Satan does use some of those heterodox uh, things to undermine the church. Um, and then, yeah, definitely uh, anything that's heretical, like anything with Mormonism or, uh, yeah, good, okay? Uh, the other well, I, I, I don't know, I went to some more non-church yeah. type things like commercial, commercials, movies. Okay, how so? How do those undermine? Well, they advertise, you know, you know, different things. Movies in particular can, can uh, twist, you know, biblical stories or whatever mm -hmm. to uh, present facts. Fake news facts instead of reality, or yeah. So they kind of either maybe I missed the point of it. Was no, that's uh, like, it's, no, it's a pretty open-ended question. So there's not really the wrong way to read it. No, I think that's fair. Uh, sometimes they portray Christians not as they really are. Uh, they give kind of a false picture of Christians. That's good. I just yeah, you go ahead. Well, I just. My first thoughts went to some of the televangelists who yeah. they're totally out for their own money and like yeah. Tammy Faye and Jimmy Baker. I mean, and then they live this extravagant or lifestyle and like new air conditioner or just, my new airplane or whatever. <laughs> you know, or even some of the churches, the big churches in this area, where you know half their families are on their payroll and they live in these mansions and you know they're. They're charismatic and bring in a lot of people, but they're not using. Yeah, and so they, uh, yeah, they, they pretend to be bringing the gospel, yeah. uh, but maybe they're not. They're not at least the full of gospel. Good. There's a couple of things I threw in there too that, from a cultural standpoint, this culture we have of acceptance that flies in the face of Christianity on a lot of different issues. Um, and so. It, it, uh, they're masquerading as the light, because uh, they're, they're pretending that like 
So if you're not, if you're accept, if you are tolerant or accepting, then you are a good person. Right. If you accept pro-choice, for example. Yeah, and so it's like creating a different uh, idea of what the light is, what the good and then, is. And except the baby doesn't get a load. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing I had in there was political correctness, and it's this, almost this philosophy today, there is no right or wrong. <coughs> hmm. I feel like political correctness is that there is a very much, there's a right and a wrong. Don't you think that, that, that they, people who uh, preach the political correctness thing is that they... But their idea is right, so you cannot say this, and if you say these things, then you're not right. That's true, but I think there's, there's one here that, that we are, as a society today, a modern society, not just the United States, but worldwide, it's like we're trying to dumb down the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. I think we're trying to create a different right or wrong. Yeah. I feel like there's so much shame and there's well, so much... And, but the, and that's very biblical, what you just said, because in, I think it's Revelations and Second Thessalonians, they say... It will call the right wrong and the wrong right. Yeah, so that, that fits much more with what we're talking about. Yes. They're, they're, they're masquerading as what's good and what's yeah. right. I think that's a good point. And so they're trying to create that. <clears throat> they're trying to say, or twist God's word, right? Manipulate. Uh, that's what Satan does. He manipulates what is good. Even the natural law that God puts on our hearts, he even tries to manipulate um, so that we are, yeah. That's a good, good point. Any other thoughts for that one? The only, I just, I don't know if this really makes any sense, but um, just anyone, you know, whether it be politician or whoever, who just claims that they're so righteous and you're the sinner and mm -hmm. never acknowledging their own sins. I, I just think they portray themselves as some, you know, more perfect person than others and put down other people's sins above theirs. I, yeah, so exalting themselves yeah. and lowering others. That's a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, I had also, um, I think there's a lot of people, I feel like when I watch TV shows and stuff, they're trying to present like a false Christianity or like a, uh, just like a really watered down Christianity. Um, so that it's basically to be a good person, um, to not cheat or lie or do things like that. Um, but then when it comes to like sexual sins, uh, stuff like that, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then people just, I think also, um, people who just claim that they're Christians but don't live a Christian life in any way. Uh, I think that that's a bad example. That just, yeah. It's interesting. I was re I was listening to this interview with Justin Bieber, and uh, he was getting interviewed by a guy, and uh, he was saying that he was like raised Christian, but he never had like a good example of what a Christian was. And so he didn't really even know what a Christian was until like two years ago when he finally met like some real Christians, and now he like has changed his whole life, and so. It's interesting. I mean, he had some bad stuff about accepting Jesus into his heart and everything, but he's actually, uh, now that he finally like knew what a real Christian was, he didn't know, even from reading the Bible, he didn't know, uh, he didn't really understand that he was like sinful, uh, and stuff like that. And so, but, I mean, so, just bad examples, people living, saying that they're Christians, but not uh, living like they're Christians. Well, if you say you're a Christian and you put down people for giving in to homosexuality, then you're accused of being the non-Christian. When you say what yeah. you're doing is, is wrong, then you're accused of being the non-Christian. Yeah, yeah. And that's just, yeah, that's just a misunderstanding of, yeah, of judgment and what that all means. All right, let's keep going. Letter B. How can you protect yourself from being deceived? Scripture. Okay. Reading the Bible. That's good. What else? I'm saying these kinds of things. So there any questions that you can't discern on your own? Then. Yeah. Yeah. Being or seeking out teaching, because we don't just uh, um, like our faith is more than just the Bible. Right, because there's stuff that we, words we say, 
things we do that are not exactly word for word, for word from the Bible, uh, but they're still part of our Christian faith. And so that's exactly right, right? Listening to the pastor preach, going to Bible study, um, anything else? Well, Hebrew says don't become dull of hearing, so I guess that means don't ever... <laughs> Yeah, Al. <laughs> and no wonder he never heard me. He can't hear women's voices. He can hear men. Hmm. Now he's got an excuse, I guess. But anyway, to me, dull of hearing means you're not really trying, maybe. You're just, you're hearing, you're hearing someone's talking, but you're not really listening and not really understanding, maybe. Yeah, I think complacency is kind of like it. Apathy, maybe. Yeah. Apathetic. Uh, becoming, yeah, just um, sitting in church, just sitting in church and just being there. Um, not as big of a problem as it used to be because people don't go to church anymore. Yeah. Um, but I think more people that go to church today are actually engaged because it's not as much of a cultural thing to just go to church. But like 30, 40 years ago, there were probably a lot of people that were just sitting in church and, and, and were just there. Um, so I think that's the dull of hearing. I think challenging yourself. We talked about in Bible study, the beginning of our worship one or whatever. Um, how are you active in church? Uh, are you actively thinking about uh, the gospel, the Old Testament, the epistle? Are you actively uh, doing things? We had a uh, we had a pastor that that uh, I was very fond of up at Christ in the I remember during the prayers he was talking about the scriptures. Is a grant that we may read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the scriptures. Yeah. I really think those are appropriate for what we're talking about here. So, sorry, say it again. He would say that when it pertains to studying the Bible, grant that we may read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest yeah. the scriptures. I've heard that phrase. Yeah. That's kosher. I think that's okay. No, I, I like it. I think that's very appropriate for. Oh, you like it? Okay. Yes, I thought absolutely. you said you didn't like it. No, I love it. Yeah, because you said you weren't very fond of it. He was. He was. I, I was very. Fond oh, of you it. was very. You were. You were very. He fond. can't hear men's voices. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, I can't hear men's voices all. Uh, as long as got it. Okay, you voice. were very fond of it. Okay, yeah. I also can't like hear on my right ear very well. Oh. I've been like sick for a while. Uh, uh, I'm not really sick, but it's just like, every morning I wake up and I can't hear on my right ear, and then by the it kind of goes away. Hmm. So I don't know. What's going on? I don't have any other symptoms. Like I'm not. I don't feel tired or. Have you been to the doctor? No. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> just you know, I yeah. don't have mine flushed Flush out. Oh, yeah. well, yeah. that's not your back. Back. I clean my ears. Well, I can be way down. And yeah, yeah. Stand so did I, and it didn't matter. It got packed down there. All right, I, I do need to go to the doctor. I haven't been to the doctor, <laughs> I haven't been to the doctor in like three years. Three four years. Just because I don't. It's, it's weird moving around. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like then I have to find a doctor, mm -hmm. go into the uh, walk in, and I don't like going to the walk in because the doctors are all, they don't seem to care that much. Um, but whatever. I should go to the doctor. You got it. Okay, fine. I'll go to the doctor. Uh, <coughs> moving on. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> All right, number eight. Uh, Paul speaks in a way that is bitingly satirical. In verses 16 to 18, he proposes to boast a little, since the false teachers have boasted about comparatively puny and even deceptive things. How had Paul's opponents treated the Corinthians? Verses 19 to 21a. Made slaves of them, devour them, take advantage of you, put on your ears, strike you in the face. And they were paying for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, those are all figurative things. Yeah, the author took them very literally for whatever reason yeah. in, the, in the thing in here. Uh, but I think, what was the first thing you said? Made slaves of them. Which means they were treated. Beneath them, second class. They were exploited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 exploited yeah. them. I think it's also making slaves, uh, making them slaves not only to the, the teachers, but also to the law. Um, some of the Judaizers always want to bring the Gentiles under the law. So that's a good part of it, too. Something else to say? Nope. Um, 
So like striking them in the face and you know, no. Yeah, I don't know if they really putting them in their place or what that means. Yeah. Putting I think it's more of a verbal I think that's problem. A problem. Yeah. Than physically attacking. Them. Yeah, I think he is exaggerating to make the point yeah. of what they have become, and they're paying for it. It's exaggerated. <laughs> uh, okay, letter B. There it is. Why do you suppose the Corinthians had put up with such abuse and treatment? They didn't know any better. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's really good. I think they didn't know any better. They maybe just didn't, yeah, they didn't know. Or they just didn't think about it. Like, they didn't think about. Part of their culture, I think. Well, I think not, lack of discernment, too. Yeah. I think they were morally flawed. We know that, you know that. Um, yeah, so they, they, they strayed from the true gospel. And the other one I have in that ties into that, they're without a compass. Yeah, I think that all kind of goes along with the being spiritually immature thing yeah. uh, that Paul keeps bringing up. Um, yeah, they were just kind of immature. Uh, they didn't know any better. They maybe just didn't think about, oh yeah, we are kind of their slaves. We do kind of just pay them and then they do whatever they want. Uh, that's a good point. Um, okay, number C, letter C. Why do you think Paul would not treat the Corinthians in that way? What he treat them in that way? He's there to raise them up. It's like a parent raises a, a baby up and yeah. they get more milk and then they get that soft food and then they go to meat. Well, mm -hmm. I, I put that because he was teaching and treating them the way Christ would have. It's his love. Trying to emulate yeah. them. Yeah. His love yeah. Him. yeah, and that whole lowering himself to exalt them. That's the kind of language he uses. Plus, he only had one motive is to teach the gospel, mm. the true gospel to them. Yep. Okay. Yeah. But you know, a lot of parents speak down to their children, you know, like, why didn't you do that? Or something, mm. you know, that's not what he did. I mean, he, he wasn't speaking to these proverbial children of the faith like that. He didn't motivate them that way. He motivated them through love and humbleness. Well, he smacked them pretty hard a couple of times. A couple of times a while, he's got to go in the back in pretty much. But, but it's always out of love. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not crushing them. But I saw something on Facebook one time where somebody's grandkid was acting up and whatever. And the grandparents, you know, the parents were, you know, you know like you getting out of hand. And then he and grandpa grabbed him and said, I love you too much. To allow you to act that way, <laughs> and it kind of calmed the kid down because he wasn't yelling, he wasn't swinging, he wasn't yeah. doing that kind of thing. So, okay, day number three. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, the less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many, sleepless, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food and cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? Wait, is it 28? All the way to 33. Sorry, I, the I can never remember. Uh, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window and wall and escaped his hand. 
Paul now compares his own standing in service to the Lord with the claims of, of those who oppose him and seek to undermine his authority. List the, their claims and Paul's response to their claims. Base your list off of verses 22 to 23. List their claims. Well, they, they were claiming that they were Hebrews, Israelites, an offspring of Abraham. I think so. And to which you um, responded, so am I. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what they were doing. I don't necessarily get that. Uh, I guess probably. I don't know. Um, let me see what he has. I get that out of the notes, I think. <laughs> what did you say? <coughs> I got that out of the You got that out of the notes? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I did look at the notes for that one. No, it says that. It says that right in the verse. But the other one he says is, they say they're a servant of Christ, and he says, He's a better I am a better one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so his response to them is that he is the same but better uh, at the end. But only, but he only boasts. <coughs> What's the one that he says that he's a better one? He's a servant of Christ. Yeah, and so it's like he's a better servant, which is kind of a weird thing to uh, say. It's not like so much boasting yourself up, it's just that you're better at fault at doing what he tells you to do. Um, better servant. Um, but I think that's a truth. That, that, that's a truth. I'm not sure it's boasting. I think it's saying, here's the difference is, these are false prophets. Yeah. And not for real. Yeah, no, all right. I think it was it's still boasting, but boasting isn't always bad. Uh, I don't think boasting means necessarily has to be bad. Um, but yeah, that's the one thing that he says that about himself that he is a better serve. Good. All right. Um, let's go to number 10. What dangers and deprivations did Paul face in the service to God? Yeah, yeah there was a ton of A lot of them, right? That was a long one. They didn't give you a near enough space. Yeah. yeah a lot of, a lot of stuff. Greetings. So... Uh, I guess if you had to summarize them, uh, imprisonment. imprisonment, beatings, torture, um, death threats. Yeah, death threats from all different kinds of people, from even, uh, let's see, what's the note for dangers of my own people? The governor of Damascus? Yeah. Um, I think he said, well, yeah, dangers from the Jews and dangers from the yeah. Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Uh, from everybody, even the even nature, <laughs> yeah, even rivers and seas, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then uh, letter B. What does Paul's willingness to face such dangers tell you about his devotion to Christ? He's all in, total commitment. Mm -hmm. It's absolute, without question. Yeah, because he's going through all these hard things, all in. Um, let earthly discomforts and dangers dissuade him from spreading the gospel. Yeah. I think it says something about his message, too, that's trustworthy because all this bad stuff is happening to him and he's still saying it. People are persecuting him and he's still saying it. Um, uh, that's what people, that's how people make arguments for the, um, for the truth of the Bible, or for the, 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 the things that really happened, like the resurrection really happened, because all these disciples were willing to die, um, and that there were all these people that were willing to go through all this struggle to make it real, um, and they had everything to gain by saying it's not true. So they were either crazy people, or it really happened. And they were all crazy, and they would have had to all be crazy. All right. Um, number 11. Besides all these physical trials, what other pressure did Paul experience? Concerns of the church. <clears throat> yeah, what do you mean by that? He was very much aware of what's going on, and he was wanting to keep bringing people up. So he was always concerned for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sheep would wander. He'd worry about that. <clears throat> Yeah, the anxiety. Yeah, the, the pressure worry. he felt to make sure that they stayed strong and mm -hmm. not be lost. 
Yeah, what could he do better to right. bring him around? There was a, definitely a sense of personal responsibility and ownership in that mission. Ownership, that yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> yeah, respons- all that anxiety that, kept, that comes from that ownership and the, yeah, uh, feeling responsible. Um, I'm sure he worried about them uh, because they're going through all this persecution too. So I'm sure he worried not only about their physical well-being, or about their spiritual, but also their physical well-being. So here is a question I have for you. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, be anxious for nothing. Yeah. And here's Paul with his anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Well, and I think, I think there is nothing graver than a person going to the grave without the knowledge of Christ. I mean, that is, that is just so hopeless. And it's really hard to set that aside. That what good is worrying you about it? God gave you so many hours in a day, and Paul and his cohorts were, I mean, when they were out of sight, they were like a duck swimming. I mean, it looks calm and collected up on top, but underneath, they're paddling like mad. And they're doing all they can, so I, I don't understand his anxiety. Maybe well, you know, I right. think, to me, there's a difference between personal anxiety, worrying about your troubles, versus worrying about his sheep. Yeah, especially Jesus when he's worried about his sheep. Especially I mean, when he sees these false sheep. teachers yeah. stealing them away. So, that makes sense. I, I, I just mean, feel like, like Jesus is more talking about our earthly troubles, whereas what Paul is anxious about. See, but, Paul, but Paul never claims to be... Like, Paul isn't Jesus here, so Paul's not claiming to be perfect, and Paul's even boasting of his weaknesses here. Mm-hmm. And so I think that maybe... Uh, I, I don't think that uh, right. If Paul was perfect, then he wouldn't have he wouldn't be worried about the churches because he would know it's like if God's in control. He's not the one in control. That's true. Um, and so I think maybe I don't think Paul is ever afraid of saying things that he's not doing right. Um, I think that so I think um, I think that this is him just talking about his weakness. Um, but it's like an earthly, I mean, it's a weakness, but it, it, he's saying, why is he telling them that he has this anxiety? Why, why do you think he's telling them? So they understand that they're not doing, they're not coming along like they're supposed to be. You're causing me worry and heartburn yeah. and just sleepless nights. Okay, maybe, yeah. maybe. So that's a, that, that is a uh, pessimistic way to look at it. What's up? What's an optimistic way to look at it? I really do care. Yeah. So he's showing them that he really does care. I think that that's. I, but it could be both. Um, but I lean more towards he's showing them his anxiety and his weakness. Uh, maybe because he's saying that he's showing that he cares about all these churches. Um, so I think that's why he is. He's showing this anxiety. Um, well, like the parents is, uh, children, you, you do everything that you're supposed to do as a Christian parent. You bring your kids to Sunday school, you're creating all that. And then you get anxious about what they're, where they're going, that they may be leading astray or they may be because of things that they do in their life. But you can't really change it for them, they have to do it, but you're still anxious about, did I really do enough? Is there something I can do without turning them off? Because you know, you've talked about that, and they said, you don't stop bugging me about it, you know, yeah. that, that fine line. Yeah, and so Paul, what, and so what do you think Paul did about his anxiety for the churches? I think he went to prayer. Right, yeah, and so that's how God, that God uses well, I think that's maybe the next question more, but, uh, but God uses those things, uh, anxieties, thorn in the flesh, to turn you back to God. Um, yeah, that's, that's letter C. Um, so. Um, 11B. Yeah, 11B. We kind of already talked about it, I guess. But yeah, 11B, what do you guys have for that one? Does the verse 29 tell you about? Get empathy for him. Well, he, he's a true shepherd. It's like that story with one sheep is lost, leave the 99 and go seek the one. He was seeking all of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you're right. I'm not sure. That has no, to be I said good. something about he. He really. He's trying to convince them to stand tall and strong against the false teachers. I don't know. This one was on my It's a little confusing answer. what yeah. he means. Uh, I think he identified with the members of his congregation there. That you have weaknesses, so do I. Yeah, I think that's that's what it is. I think that he. Uh, I think he's showing them that he is with them. I think it's the empathy, uh, empathy thing that um, he's saying that when you're weak, I feel weak. Um, but I don't necessarily know what the, the second sentence means. Who is well, that Paul? I had something different. That he took it seriously. If anybody sinned, he felt the shame of the offense and wanted to help the one that was accused. So he put yeah, himself that's... in the place of the person. Okay, yeah, I think that's the empathy part of it. That, yeah, he's going through these things with them, so when they sin, he feels that shame too. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh... Anybody else have anything for that they want to share? Alright, let's keep going then. Number 12. Read verse 30, why would Paul make his greatest boast about his own weakness? In, in this connection, look ahead now to 12, 9 to 10. I just said because Christ had told him that his grace was sufficient for him. And his power was made perfect in weakness, and, and Christ's power was made perfect in weakness, so Paul shouldn't worry about it. It worked for me, you know, kind of thing. It's Christ. Mm -hmm. So, but he boasts about his weaknesses here. So, why, what does that verse have to do with? Uh, I guess, why does Paul view both weaknesses as a good thing? It's got another way to it. Gives glory to God because everything that's accomplished is God's <coughs> accomplishment, not his. Okay. Okay. So, what was accomplished? All the conversions. Mm -hmm. the people wishing. Yeah. God. Yeah, right. So you're right. That was God. Um, but what about weakness? How does weakness and why is weakness a good thing? Why is he boasting about his weaknesses? Well, I don't know. I have put down that through going through all these things. He didn't look weak, he actually was made strong, kind of like Christ was made weak as a human and crucified to bring us to salvation. That showed his true power. So kind of going through a lot of hard things really makes you stronger in faith. You know? so, yeah, so I think it's really close to what Rogers said. It's the, it's, um, the weaknesses um, are... Him boasting of his weaknesses, all of these things happen to him. It really outlines and exalts the power of Christ. And so he's like saying, I'm weak and I can't do all this stuff, but all this stuff still happened. And so it was Christ who did these things because I am weak and I am these things. And even, even so, Christ did these things. Um, let's see. Well, I think when. when God's power is made perfect, he's glorified. <clears throat> yeah. And so when God's power is made perfect, so what, do you, what does that mean? When I, I think we are we are sinful creatures and when God sees our frailties, whether it's spiritual or physical, and he picks us up and carries us, mm -hmm. that's when his power towards us is made perfect. That's what Christ was in the world to do. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it, right? And so then when other see, people see that too, then it's um, it's a witness. Uh, and so you're, yeah, you're lifting, exalting Christ and lowering yourself. Um, okay, good. Um, let's keep going then. Letter B, how was the incident Paul describes in verse 32 to 33 a humbling instance showing up Paul's weakness? Uh, how is the incident Paul describes in verse 32 to 33 a humbling instance showing off Paul's weakness? 
Well, he was now being hunted just like he used to hunt for the Christians. Mm, okay, interesting. I didn't think about it like that. So he was being hunted. I mean, he had to escape through a window in a wall to get away. I mean, you know, I'm sure. Yeah. Whatever, you know, when he was hunting from, he was tenacious in hunting them down. And yeah. So was this governor of Damascus. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. I wasn't thinking about it like that. Uh, but that makes that makes a good, that makes a lot of sense. Because um, Paul was this, yeah, exactly. Paul was the guy. He was the persecutor, and now he has been. God humbled him and made him the persecuted. Uh, that's good. That's, that's not what I have. But that's good. I just this image of him being lowered in a basket, kind of like a baby. Oh, helpless. Oh, yeah. Helpless. I didn't think that either. That's interesting. And then that brings him on Christ being more as a helpless baby. Yeah. So. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting Maybe too. That and that he that. was kind of, uh, and he couldn't have lowered himself, so he had other people lower him. Um, that's interesting he, too. He was dependent on somebody else, not himself. Yeah. And just the I, fact I still that he's not, did not fighting back, instead of you know cowering and being lowered in this little basket, you know, he's instead of standing up to them, you know, he's. Escaping and yeah. running, I guess. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. So what I had, I had um, that uh, his preaching and everything didn't work. And so I thought that that's what he meant. I was confused by the question a little bit. Um, and even the answer that they had was still a little confusing. Yeah. I think it was closer to what Mark had. But I had that it was uh, his preaching didn't work. And so everyone turned against him except for probably the Christians that were already there. And so then um, he had to escape. And I think that it, it plays into to what you, also to what you said about him becoming the persecutor instead of the persecutor. Okay, so then C is kind of the personal, or the uh, now, uh, now bringing it to, a, to our lives. Too often we attempt to hide our weaknesses so others will think we are better or stronger than we really are. How do you think letting others see us as we are, including our weaknesses, can actually work to build us, build up us and others? Okay. So I, I said it shows that even though we are weak and sinful, we too can be saved as can they. Okay. All right. So, uh, let's say that again. It, it, okay. How do you think letting others know we are, including our weaknesses, mm -hmm. okay, it shows that even though we are weak and sinful, we too can be saved as can they. Okay. So we are... Um, Saying that we are weak and sinful as well as them. Right? Yeah, you don't have to be some mm. on the appearance of perfect person to be saved. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Right. And to our ears, that makes sense. Or uh, that seems kind of obvious, right? That somebody who's weak needs to be saved. Uh, but that's not really how our culture works. Um, nope. Especially not like right election season. Uh, everybody's trying to show how not flawed they are and how flawed everyone else is. Yeah. Uh, which I mean is not terrible. It's not really a bad thing because if you're trying to be president you probably should be better than some people. Uh, especially in our culture showing your faults is not a very good thing. And we have anything else? Well unfortunately it seems like putting other people down it's the way to get elected because that seems to work for some reason. Yeah, but unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. I just said, you know, just being honest and truthful, admitting our weaknesses, you know, makes us relatable to others. Relatable, that's what that you know. mm -hmm. But if, if Mark knows what my weaknesses are, my fellow congregants here, the people say they know what my weaknesses are, they can build me up, make me a better person. Uh, yeah, that's good, right? That's. That is a humbling thing, right? That's, yeah. uh, you have to, a lot of people, yeah, they don't think about it like that. They think about trying to hide their weaknesses, hide, hide everything that's wrong with them so that people don't think less of them. Or, because uh, they don't, because that's not how the world works. They don't try to build up your 
weaknesses. They just kind of tear you down more. Uh, but the church should be the opposite of that. Say some pastors struggle with that. Uh, how much do you let people see your weaknesses? Um, you know, I've had pastors that don't want to share weaknesses or anything or anything like that. Well, I can, you know, you see with the Corinthians. I mean, they fed and thought that Paul was weak and so they went astray. So I'm sure pastors kind of. I'm not sure other congregants might take it. Maybe some congregants don't want to hear about their pastor's weaknesses or real, recognize them because yeah. they put them on a pedestal. And yeah. Well, they're supposed to be God's stand-in for him. Yeah. So if they are weak, then that means God is weak. I mean, that, that's like... They could draw that conclusion. That conclusion, yeah. I think some people would, too. Yeah. Because they, they could put them... Yeah. It's hard to draw the line between showing your weaknesses and not showing your weaknesses. I think there's a difference between a weakness and a fatal flaw, though. Mm -hmm. and I you think do. When, when I, <laughs> no, I think, you know, we talked no, about... I'm not saying you think that. I'm just saying not everybody thinks that. But you're right. So Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I think, you know, heresy, that's a fatal flaw. I'm sorry you're out of here. But when we have, like, a personal weakness or whatever, and, and uh, as a... As a, as a congregation that would be considered mature in the faith, I think I would want my parishioners to know about this so they can help me through that, they can pray for me, edify me, support me, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a congregation that's mature in the faith would take that approach. Yeah. Well, when Pastor had this problem, I'm sure that was not something people expected to see when they came to church that day, to see their pastor Doubled over. Doubled over. I mean, I, I think that might have. And I'm sure there's some discussions at home. What was wrong with Pastor? You know, is he going to die? You know, that type of thing. But as you said, it was an example to pray for him, lift him up. Like, and like he said, I never knew I had so many mothers. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's funny. Yeah, okay, good. Let's move on to day four. Um. Well, one to ten. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who fourteen years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given, to, was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I plead with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay. Uh, number 13. What Paul has boasted about up to now has concerned extraordinary experiences in the earthly, physical realm. But he isn't through. His words in 12.1 imply you haven't seen anything yet. What in this section would lead you to think that Paul is referring to himself as he describes the experiences of the person he calls the man in Christ? Well, I think when he was on his conversion, when it took place, when he was blinded by Christ, 
that when he was blind, possibly Jesus showed him more when he was blind, went through, you might say, mental, showed him what was going on. Okay. To, to converse him, do the, well, to teach him what to do. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think most people think that this experience happened to him in the desert. Um, and so he goes, so you're right, he gets he's blinded, and then he talks to Jesus, and then he goes kind of away for a while. So we're not totally sure where he is, if he's just in Damascus. Um, some people think he was in the desert, and then there, Christ comes to him, and this all happens. Um, so I don't know if people think it was the, it was right at, right, I don't, I think people don't think it was uh, right at that moment when he was blinded. But there is something like this that happens then, right? Because he sees Jesus. Um, but yeah, I think that this happens after that. Um, well, so back to the question: is yeah. Why do you think it's referring to him? It's that there are details that only the person who experienced it can know. That's, I mean, that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and, like uh, when they find the killer; he knows details nobody else would know. <laughs> and so, especially because of what he says here, because he says, yeah. uh, "What did he say?" He heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And so, if he heard things, this other guy heard things, how and he no one's supposed to tell or utter, how would Paul know about that? Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. He knows things. Yeah. Yeah, good. And also, verse 7. Yeah. You, that's you, Roger. Yeah, sorry if I stole your <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, verse 7, too, is, so to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness, that's pretty obvious. Kind of a lame question. Uh, 14. Paul was certain about some aspects of this experience and uncertain about other aspects. What about that experience, however, made it something that might be boasted about? Remember the principle Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 1, 31 and 2 Corinthians 10, 13 and 17. Okay. Um, what was he certain, or what was he uncertain about? Says it twice. Stuff, yeah, he didn't yeah. have a body. Yeah, he didn't know if he was like uh, hallucinating or physically up there. Yeah, or not hallucinating. That's a bad way to think about it. If he was having a vision, okay, not hallucinating. Uh, <laughs> because that would make that would make all that made up probably. Uh, he wasn't sure if it was a vision or if it was actual. Yeah, if Jesus actually came to him wherever he was. Uh, good. Okay, but what is he certain about? Revelations of the Lord. Yeah, so that it came from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So he's certain that it came from Christ. Um, good. Okay, so then what is what about that made it worthy of being boasted? He was boasting on Christ, not himself. Yeah, right, and so he keeps uh, he kept saying, but God knows. Yeah, so he's like, I don't really know if this was real, if I was if he came to me or not, or if it was a vision, uh, but it's all Jesus. Jesus did it. Jesus told me this. So it's him, not me. Nothing about me. Uh, yeah, good. And it, I think it makes him even more certain that he's doing what Christ wanted him to be doing. And yeah. The truth of the Gospels. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. That's a good point, too. That yeah, makes him even more certain. All right, uh, number 15. Consider what Paul says about his boasting in verses 5 to 6. What guidance might you glean from those but verses when you consider your accomplishments and blessings? <clears throat> there's, there's a hymn out we use about stewardship. We give thee but thine own, whatever that gift may be. Yeah. All that I have is thine alone, and I trust the Lord for me. So everything I use. To God alone the glory. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you had a vision. What's yeah. that? Especially you have if you had a vision. I don't know how direct this is for us, but I think what you're saying is right. Uh, I don't know if we can necessarily get that from these verses, uh, but I think what you're saying is right. <clears throat> that uh, everything we do, we should try to do it to the glory of God. Or give the credit to God, not to yourself. Don't say, look what I did. Yeah, 
At least in some respects. Yeah. I think it's okay to have like a resume and say like, <laughs> you don't have to put a header at the top that says, I didn't do any of this stuff, God did it. Uh, but I think you can, uh, I think it, God gave you the blessings, right? God gave yeah. you, so you don't want to just make it, make everything you do separate from yourself. Uh, but God gave you that skill. And so you can use that skill. It's yours. God gave it to you. You're not just loaning that skill from God. God gave that to you. Um, God gave Adam things. Um, and so, right, it comes from God. But God gave it to you. And so it's yours now. And so you, that's okay to, uh, to use it. <laughs> and it's okay to, I mean, not boast. Boasting for the sake of bringing other people down is bad. Boasting for the sake of exalting yourself is bad. Uh, but saying, uh, God gave, made me really good at, uh, I don't know, woodworking or something, right? So it's okay. It's you, right? It's okay to boast a little bit. You don't have to say everything's not mine. Uh, some people go so far with the... Uh, what? <laughs> He yeah, said, this woodworker was just counting to make sure I still had ten fingers. <laughs> well, and I think it also goes back to, you know, I think it's in the verse 6, where he doesn't want to boast because he doesn't want people to be dis you know, distracted from the message. And instead of worshiping the messenger, they're worshiping the message. Yeah, and so that's, that's why it's a little bit different for us, right? Because, yeah. like, when you're building something or when you are... Uh, I don't know, talking to people, trying to teach them how to do something that doesn't have anything to do with God. Um, by boasting about that, you're not um, getting in the way of the message. Uh, you know what I mean? Like when you're building a table or something, you're not necessarily uh, doing evangelism or you're not preaching or something. So that's why I'm not sure if it's a direct uh, right to us here, um, but when you think about it as the church, as a, as, a, as this church or another church, um, not just saying, oh, our church is so great because we don't have any conflict and we, people give money and we're going to make this great building, look how great we are, um, but rather it's uh, God is going to work through us, God has blessed us with all these things. Um, does that make sense? I think, yeah, right, but what you're saying before is right, God, is, everything we do should be to the glory of God, um, but I just don't know if we need to make that connection with these verses, um, but that's what happens with Bible study, sometimes they just kind of try to go too much into personal application, um, when there's lots of other great verses talking about that, about vocation and stuff like that, um, all right. Day five. Oh, no, not day five. What am I talking about? Number 16. Paul was given many wonderful privileges by God, including a unique place in Christian history. Paul might have been tempted to think very highly of himself, perhaps even to become conceited. How did God guard Paul against that temptation? His affliction? Hmm? His affliction, whatever. Yeah, the thorn, right? That's what the, the thorn in the flesh, whatever that was. Good. And he denied, and Paul, when Paul prayed about it three times, he denied him all three times. You know, your grace is sufficient. <laughs> yeah. My grace is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um, so the thorn. Kind of, what did the thorn do? What did it do for Paul? Torments you. Tormenting him. Well, it keeps you keeps you humble because it always reminds you, you know, reminds you that Something you're not perfect or whatever. Yeah, tormented him. It kind of <clears throat> reminded him that he was not perfect. Um, yeah, it constantly kind of yeah reminded him that he was sinful, broken. Yeah. Um, even maybe made things harder for him, like even made preaching harder or doing stuff like that, right? Except for 
verse 11 or B doesn't, that's not really an important question. It doesn't, we don't really know that much about it. Um, but it kind of kept him from uh, thinking that he was this great, um, perfect person. Um, yes, the way it worded, the messenger of Satan and harassing. Yeah. So, the messenger of Satan. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. that's kind of like, Kind of like Job. Well, Job he should Yeah. So he, he let him have his burden. To well, even, test his faith, maybe test his. But even Christ was tempted by yeah. sin, so he had. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that. Uh, yeah. We'll talk a little bit more that about that in C. So let's go on to C, because uh, the B is basically not a whole lot. Um, I think the study note said it was like. A, Maybe it was like uh, an illness or something. Uh, I've heard lots of diverticulitis. I've heard lots of crazy <laughs> things that people say about yeah. the thorn in the flesh. But we don't know. Yeah, we don't know, right? It's not important. It doesn't really matter. Uh, okay, so C. Think about the lesson God taught Paul through this difficulty. Verse nine. Has God impressed the same lesson upon you? If so, what means did He use? Consider telling your discussion group about it. <laughs> um, is that referring to something that we've experienced that keeps coming back? Like a, I don't think it has to be something that comes back. Uh, I think to so I put yes, but it's too personal to discuss in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. Uh, so the question is basically, uh, what? Why do we? I mean, I guess. You can say, why do bad things happen to us, right? Why do people have thorns in the flesh? Why do... That's yeah. sin. Okay, sin. That's the easy answer. Why God not? can do everything, right? So why does God... Why did God give him the thorn in the flesh? I think we see it all the time. During the hardest times, that's when we rely on Christ the most and our fellow believers the most to mm -hmm. get us through it. I think it strengthens your faith your faith once you come through. So I think yeah, the reason times. I think the reason God gave it to Paul was Paul, you've been given a gift here. Don't get full of yourself. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah I think focused it, on the message. He also what Sue said uh, too about um, that the God gives us these thorns in the flesh, he gives us troubles, hard times, trials, sicknesses, illnesses, um, to turn us back to him. And so there's, there's false, the false teacher would tell you that God is putting this thing, this hard thing in front of you for you to overcome and for you to become a better person through it. Uh, you're going to be smarter, or you're going to know better after God put you through this, because he's got a greater plan for you. Um, yeah. But really, it's the complete opposite. So God puts these things in front of you to show you how not great you are, how uh, broken you really are, um, and so that you will turn back to him. So that you will turn back to him. Doesn't it also, a lot of times, false... Teaching would say that Satan is completely separate from God, that mm -hmm. he can rule this world, and they don't think that God is in control of Satan, but no. that's being worked through God. So sometimes they have it both ways. It's weird because they don't, when you follow through it, it doesn't make a lot of sense because it's like you against Satan. But then people will also say that God has a plan for you to overcome this and become better. So it's not re it's not really consistent. Because you're, you're right, sometimes they do say, uh, this is just the devil. God, take this devil away from me. I've heard people say that before. Well, pastor said it a lot of times. God is in control. He, though, sometimes allows the devil to do that testing. Not, not God doesn't test us. He allows the devil to. Oh, I thought I said that that's one and the same, really. Well, yeah, it is kind of semantics, right? Yeah. It's, it's, I'm, but God's in control, so if he didn't want you to have that thorn, 
Yeah, you know, like the devil give it to you. Yeah, or I it's mean, like Job. You can do anything to him, but you can't kill him. Yeah, but even here, I mean, God gives him the thorn. God sends well, all throughout okay. the Old Testament. <laughs> I guess that's true. Uh, but no, so sometimes it is though, because it, it's not cut and dry. It's not uh, one plus one equals two. Uh, it's not like super obvious uh, how God works, like and how like the God Satan relationship works. Because uh, like we as uh, good German Lutherans want to figure out how everything works and have exactly how it it know exactly how it works, um, but we, we can't really understand. Uh, but what we do know, uh, we know God is in control of everything. But we also know that Satan tempts us. So how do those two things kind of go together? God's in control of everything, Satan tempts us. Uh, we just trust that it's much easier to trust that God is in control of everything. And so that's even, it's so, it's so funny how people want to say that it's like, God did not make you sick. Um, I would much rather have God make me sick than just the devil being in control and doing every, be able to be able to do whatever he wants. I'd rather have God in control of everything than the devil in control of everything, uh, because that means God can take it away. Um, so yeah, so God sends weaknesses, trials, troubles to us, not to make us a better person, not to make us smarter or stronger or anything like that, um, but to, to turn us back to Him and to strengthen our faith through that. He strengthens our faith through those things. And that's how, that's how God used Paul's thorn in the flesh. Anytime he wanted to, Paul wanted to turn towards himself and see how great he was, it would turn him back to God um, to see what he really was. Okay, um, D, what spin did Paul now put on insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties he endured for the sake of the gospel? Just had The weaknesses made, made him strong in his faith and his trust in God. Yeah. Almost. So it's almost a good thing, <laughs> right? It's almost a blessing. Uh, I'm sure you guys have met people who maybe... I've never, well, maybe, I don't know. You guys maybe know people who have been around longer than I do. Uh, than I, but I, my, I have friends that have never had anything like really hard happen to them, or they've had an easy life. And so they haven't really had to go through things or turn back to God because they've had an easy life. And so their faith, that they are faithful, is just kind of weak. Um, and so it's almost like the hard things, his thorn, all the persecutions are almost blessings. They're almost a sign that what he's doing is right. Um, anybody have anything else? I probably didn't steal any of these answers. Probably did. Sorry. Okay. Um, let's move on to day five. Yeah, 15 minutes. All right, perfect. <laughs> Uh, so we go to the bathroom before church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You missed that. You weren't here when we had that. 12, 11 to 21. Uh, for I have been a fool. You forced me to it. For I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. <clears throat> the signs of a true possible apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here, for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. Your, for children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take up the same steps? 
Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ. And all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may not find you as I wish. And that you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. And I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of their impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality as they have been practiced. <clears throat> All right. 17. <clears throat> Read Acts 19, 11 to 12. Besides helping the sick or troubled people involved, what was accomplished through signs and wonders and mighty works the, apostles, the Apostle Paul performed? Said proof that he was equal to the twelve apostles. Proof that he was an apostle. That he was, yeah, was equal to them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. That he was the apostle. That he was an apostle. I think there's there's a parallel between even Christ himself because people would reach out and touch Christ's garment when he was passing yeah. by, and mm -hmm. and yeah. they were talking about <clears throat> touching, touching his handkerchief or his apron and. Healing the sick and casting out demons. Yeah, but he so, gave those powers to the apostles. Yes. I mean, that's, yeah. And so not only gave them, but he is working through them. And so that's what Acts is all about. Acts is Acts and the Gospels are uh, the work of Christ on earth. And so everything that happens in Acts, it, it, it is exactly that. It's a parallel between what happens with Christ, uh, what happened with Christ in the Gospels. Good. Number 18. After reviewing his ministry among the Corinthians and having to assert himself far more strongly than he liked in the process, Paul declares that he has wronged them in only one respect, that he was never a burden to them. What reason does he give for this in verses 14 to 15? Why didn't he burden them? He didn't want what the Corinthians had against them. Yeah. Yeah, but he burdened everybody else. So why didn't he? Why did he decide not to burden them? I mean, burden is whatever. But he had the other people. He had them pay him. But why did he have the Corinthians pay him? He is their spiritual father. Okay, but he's also everybody else's spiritual. Well, father. I, I think. But what was special about the Corinthians? I well, guess? they were rich, and they would think he was just after their money, and so he wanted to prove to them that I don't care about your money. I don't care about your possessions. I don't care about all your wealth and status. I just want you to accept the gospel. Yeah, and so especially because they are spiritually immature, right? That's oh, the whole, that's okay. the whole thing, right? <laughs> no, but what you said is right. Uh, all that stuff. They were spiritually immature, and he is their parent. That's the language he's using here: parent and children. They are spiritually immature children, and he is their parent. Uh, he had to save up for them. He had to take care of them, not them take care of him. The other people, the Macedonians, were more mature. And so they were able to take care of him. And so he allowed them to take care of him. Um, kind of like adult, maybe like adult uh, children and their parents, uh, where you take care of your parents. Um, okay, good. Uh, they were selfish, right? Everything that Mark said, though, is right. That they are selfish. Um, they are all about worldly things. Okay, number 19. Note the charge made by his opponents that Paul sarcastically echoes in verse 16. How does Paul counter that charge in verse 17 to 18? What is their charge? That, that he was crafty and deceitful? Yep. Crafty and deceitful. Uh, whatever that means. I mean, I mean, I know what crafty and deceitful means, but I don't know how... What, <laughs> Not taking what, support is crafty. Yeah, what he exactly did. Maybe manipulate them or something. Yeah, I don't know. But I see, uh, in, that, in that phrase there, I see some influence from the super apostles. Yeah, yeah well, so that's what he's saying, yeah. right? That that's the super apostles' charge and the Corinthians' charge. And, and so the, what exactly that looks like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think the Corinthians would have come up with that on their own. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, super apostles planted that thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the contrast to what they're doing, so they're making it. Twisting it to say, well, he's not taking your support, but he's trying to pull something out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It was too good to be. Yeah. 
Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I didn't think about it. Yeah, maybe that uh, they're supposed to be paying them or something. I don't know. Uh, but then, so what does he say back to them? How does he respond? Uh, that's the second part of the question. Well, right? then he had, sent, so he had sent others who acted the same way. He had sent others to them that acted the same way. Yeah. As he did. Yeah. Roger. <coughs> he asked if he, or that he or his associate had taken any advantage of him. Yeah, so it's just it's not just him alone doing this, but there are these other people who they seem to like too. Uh, maybe they don't have so much of a problem with Titus. Um, and I they think acted I, the same way. And I think that's more than a rhetorical question. I think, give me a concrete example of where we took advantage of you. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not just him, but it's also Titus and the other brother that he sent with them. Uh, which I think they're carrying this letter. I think that's how that worked, right? We talked about that two weeks ago, that he was sending people to court to collect this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is talking about the people who brought the letter, Titus and the other brother, mm -hmm. the preacher guy. Um, yeah, I think that's what they're talking about. Okay. Um, number 19. No, 20. 20. Number 20, sorry. I don't know why, I can never remember. Uh, in the closing verses, 19 to 21, of this chapter, Paul expresses a fear, not that he will be embarrassed by them, but that he will be embarrassed for them. What do you think Paul intends to accomplish by this earnest and admonition? See also 1 John 1, 9. What do you guys get for this one? Maybe fears God's judgment on them, so he's trying to get them to turn away from their sinful ways. I think you're right, confession and repentance. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, that's the first John. It's a weird question, the first part. I had to just kind of ignore the question and look at what the verse was saying. Yeah. And then try to figure out. I think that's right. Like he's worried that they're not going to repent. Yeah. Worried that they're not going to repent. And he's worried that he's going to have to come there and there's going to be all this, uh, uh, what's the word, conflict. There's going to be conflict between him, all that bad stuff is going to happen. Um, and that he's going to have to chastise them. Um, and then also, um, what else is going to happen? Something he talks about himself and God there, doesn't he? Uh, I think it's in 21. This is in 2 Corinthians, sorry. Uh, yeah, verse 21. What does he to say that first clause? I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those. Sounds like it could be next communication on the horizon. Well, or when I got that, that God would humble him and make him, it would make him realize that he didn't do his job and save him. I think at least that he, uh, I think that's along the right lines. Uh, right? So we've got to be careful with always the save them yeah. language. That's not what you meant anyways. Uh, but yeah, so I think that, that, that that's kind of what I was speaking of too, that it's uh, God is going to humble him by showing that he's just a man. And that even though he is an apostle, even though all this stuff... Um, but still, people aren't going to always listen to him. Uh, which is a pastor uh, is humbling all the time. People will, no matter how much you teach people, no matter how much you try to do your job, uh, people still aren't always going to listen. And so it's humbling. Um, because if everybody always listened to you, then you might think you are Jesus. Um, yeah. Do you have any other comments for that one? Okay. Uh, number 19, part of the study you have done for this week, have you found personally most meaningful or applicable to your own life? Share if you feel comfortable. Uh, we don't have to go there. I think that's just a filler question. I feel like they just needed it. But well, all of them in this study have ended with that type of thing. Oh, really? What did you learn most out of this study? What did this study do? Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah you gotta, and then I got to go, since I do mine, 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, mm -hmm. and then yeah, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday. I got to go back one and I be way yeah. back on Monday, uh, Thursday, Friday. So not the worst question to think about after you went through everything. Uh, but we don't need to talk about it. So, all right, thank you guys. Uh, we're done way early today. No, that's a good job. Uh, so, good church. Next uh, week this was a pretty same. short lesson anyways. I think we'll have one more, right? Yeah, yeah, next week will be the same with that one service at noon. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one more. All right, let's pray. Oh, dear Father, thank you for this time that we got to spend together in your word. Uh, thank you for the conversation that happened. Uh, Father, uh, please bless us as we enter into the Lenten season. Uh, help us to reflect on your cross and what it means for our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we run your books out to the car again. We got time to do that. It isn't going to take me to No. Um, but if you give it to me now, if you give it to me, I'm going to live down some cream bars. Yeah. 